The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. One of the scribes came up to Jesus and put a question to him. Which is the first of all the commandments? Jesus replied, This is the first. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You must love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, Well spoken, Master. What you have said is true, that he is one and there is no other. To love with all your heart, with all your understanding and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, this is far more important than any holocaust or sacrifice. Jesus, seeing how wisely he had spoken, said, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to question him any more. The Gospel of the Lord. If we were asked what's the opposite of love, I suppose it wouldn't take us very long to come up with a convincing answer. I don't suppose anybody here wouldn't say hate. Hate's obviously the opposite to love. Well, that's obviously true. But um, Pope John Paul II gave us an alternative answer that helps us to understand what love is really all about. And in loving understa and understanding what love is about, it helps us to understand what it is to be truly human. John Paul's answer was use. The opposite of to love is to use the other. And we can see this in the modern, if you like, um, mentality, which uh, is a kind of philosophy of life called utilitarianism. In a way, it's not really modern at all. It's, uh, it's, it's millennia old. The principle, of course, is that what we should do is the thing that gives the most happiness, which is equated with pleasure, the most amount of pleasure to the largest number of people, but most especially to number one. Um, you don't do something that's not going to give you pleasure. And many people find this a, a rather convincing answer, and perhaps sometimes we might think of it ourselves. Might even come up with the expressions like, well, as long as you're happy, um, it doesn't matter. But is it possible to love when we have that kind of philosophy of life? That's the way our mindset works. Well, we might say, well, we can love another person, do something that's really good for them, gives them happiness, gives them pleasure. But the utilitarian approach can only go so far as saying, but as long, but as, long as that gives me pleasure too. So, to give a simple example, perhaps we started Christmas shopping already, we might think, oh, I'm going to get um, uh, a nice whatever it is for someone I love, and get that present. But part of the, the logic behind it is that it's going to give me pleasure seeing that they're receiving some pleasure from this gift. If we have a utilitarian approach, then if it doesn't give me pleasure to give other people pleasure, then we don't do it. It doesn't make sense with that kind of philosophy of life. So in that sense, to love, to put the other one first before ourselves, regardless of the cost of ourselves, a bit like that, a crucifix, Jesus dying on the cross, even though it was immensely painful, and it was for our good, even though some people would reject it still. So it doesn't fit in with a utilitarian um, philosophy. 
what's the opposite? What's, what's the, the one that John Paul says is the, the basic Christian philosophy of life? Well, he says it's called the personalistic norm. Um, well, this is based on an understanding of what it is to be person. And he defines person, is that good, a particular person if you like, a good, which um, the proper relationship to that is not to use that person. They're not to be used for one's own end. They're not our means to an end. That's a negative way of putting it. The positive way of putting it is a person is someone for whom our correct way of relating to is love. To think of them over and above ourselves, or at least, um, as Jesus says, to love your neighbour as yourself. So only in that kind of context, in a personalistic way of saying, the other is never to be used for my own advantage, but only for their good. Only like that can we really understand what love is about. It's when we can step back and say, no, it's for them, it's for you, whatever I'm doing. And that might be, of course, in the context of, um, of marriage, of saying, yes, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and so on, till death do us part. The guiding principle about that is, not because it's going to give me happiness or pleasure every moment of my life, but because I want your genuine, real happiness, which is not necessarily equated with, with pleasure as the only thing. Uh, Freud got it wrong. It's not the only. Sexual pleasure is not the only kind of pleasure. It's not the pinnacle pleasure. Um, the only pleasure of, of, of life. So we treat other people as persons. Now who is the, the greatest person and the source of our own personhood, to use a word I've just made up, um, of being a person? It's God, of course, because God is the ultimate good that does not permit to be used. We can't use God for our own ends. It's impossible. And he's the ultimate goodness, but of course he's also the one who gives of himself to us as creatures, giving us that freedom, that free will, to say yes or no to him. So he's the ultimate person, the, the original person, and so we are persons insofar as we're made in God's image and likeness. And so we share that with him, being a person that the proper um, kind of relationship that other persons have with us is of love, um, genuine Christian love. Uh, reading this gospel passage was chapter 12 of St. Mark. Remember last week um, we were with Bartimaeus at the end of chapter 10. So we skipped a few chapters. So if we try and think about the context of what's been happening in the story of Jesus' life up to this point that we've come to today, the greatest commandment, we've had from around about chapter 8 um, Jesus being harassed by the scribes and Pharisees when he was up in, in Galilee in the north and then running off to places which weren't, Jew, um, weren't Jewish and coming to realize that his mission was towards them as well, such as with the Syro Syrophoenician woman. And he came down through the Decapolis region, preaching, teaching. And in that context, he kept telling the disciples three times that his mission was to suffer and to die. That was what it was to be Messiah. And yet they kept misunderstanding this. They were having arguments about who was the greatest and so on. And then it was this blind man, Bartimaeus, who got it right, the blind beggar. He had faith in Jesus. After that point, which was right down at the bottom of the, the sea, uh, the, the river Jordan, just before it meets the Dead Sea, uh, that, that was um, Jericho, Jesus then made his ascent. He climbed up a very steep mountain, high mountain, up to Jerusalem. And then he entered into Jerusalem. We're familiar with that story, entering on the colt. And then we find in Jerusalem, the little patch that we've missed out, um, he chases out the money sellers in the temple because they got it wrong. That's not what it's all about. You know, worship of God is in, in spirit and truth and it's not about just making money out of sacrifices and so on. He was having arguments with, his, with, the, with the scribes and the Pharisees. And then this ends it all. He comes to this one scribe who's been listening to him and seeing that Jesus answers well, 
And so he puts this question to Jesus, not to trick him up. Now, perhaps in a way, because he is giving Jesus this opportunity to shut everybody up. He's saying, look guys, look. The most important thing to do is love. Love of God with our whole self, with our, with our mind, our strength, our understanding. And to love our neighbours ourselves. We'll stop all the wrangling about any other arguments and so on. This is it. And then we hear at the end of this Gospel passage, no one dared to question him anymore.